Welcome to the 37th meeting this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Um, members and the public should turn off mobile phones and so on, they interfere with the sound system. Um, first item today is subordinate legislation and it's a four negative instruments. The first is the Water, Environment, River Basin Management Planning, Further Provisions Scotland Regulations 2013. Uh, the Water Environment Shellfish Water Protection Areas Designation Scotland Order 2013. Uh, the Water Environment Shellfish Waters Protected Areas Environmental Objectives Scotland Regulations 2013. And the Seed Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2013. Members should note that there is no motion to annul and have been, uh, that have been received in relation to these instruments. And I refer members to the paper. I would ask... Uh, whether any of the committee uh, wish to, to make any comments and uh, then if there are no comments are we agreed that we do not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments thank you very much we move on to agenda item two which is again subordinate legislation and it concerns uh, evidence from the minister on the land reform scotland act 2003 modification order 2013 draft and statutory guidance SG 2013-254. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. And following this evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider the motion to approve the instrument under Agenda Item 3 and will consider the guidance separately under Agenda Item 4. And, uh, we welcome uh, the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, good morning, and your team. Uh, Helen Jones, Head of Team Natural Resources, Bill Hepburn, Head of Branch uh, Animal Health and Welfare, Rona Carson, Solicitor, uh, Natural Resources Division, and Barry McCaffrey, Solicitor, Animal Health, Scottish Government. And I wonder if the Minister wishes to speak to the instrument and the guidance uh, before we ask you any questions. Would convener, if that's, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, this draft order makes a small modification to the legislation that established statutory access rights to most land and inland water. Uh, the access rights set out in Part 1 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 are important ones, and I want to make it clear at the outset we're not uh, seeking to undermine uh, them. The legislation already provides for the temporary exemption of land from access rights, that is, uh, for land closure, um, if there are good reasons. Uh, this order means that where land is temporarily closed under a legislative process, core paths are included too. Uh, and I will say more about core paths later. The Act places emphasis on the local management of access. That is why draft or the draft order is accompanied by statutory guidance for access authorities, uh, that is, uh, local authorities and the national park authorities, and what it means for them. Uh, there has been public consultation in both the draft order and guidance. The National Access Forum, which includes a, br a broad spectrum of opinion, um, has been involved too. I would like now to turn to, to core paths and outline the two circumstances in which they may be closed by this modification. Uh, core paths are networks of paths required under the Act. They are for non-motorised activities like walking, cycling, horse riding and are used for recreation and everyday travel. <laughs> 31 access authorities have now adopted their core path plans, giving 19,000 kilometres of core paths in Scotland. Um, the first circumstance in which a core path may be closed is where there is a Section 11 order to close land. Uh, Organisers of outdoor uh, concerts, car rallies or sporting events sometimes seek one to ensure safety and security uh, or for admission purposes. However, the guidance for access authority stresses that Section 11 land closure orders should be used sparingly and for the minimum area and time <coughs> needed. If a core path in the area is to be closed too, it is good practice to suggest an alternative route uh, if feasible to do so. Section 11 orders for temporary land closure average 47 a year, and however, usually only one or two are for six days or more, uh, and these are subject to both public consultation and ministerial confirmation. The modification will therefore provide clarity for event organisers. This will be particularly important for two keynote events in homecoming 2014, uh, the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup. In both these cases, temporary land closures will also involve core paths. 
Uh, the second instance uh, where the modification would take effect is during an outbreak of a notifiable animal disease. Uh, when that happens, public access to land can uh, be prohibited uh, or restricted under statutory powers to deal with the outbreak. Uh, for example, existing powers uh, allow land closure around premises affected by an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. Um, at present, even if the land is closed, uh, at the moment, the core path cannot be closed. Uh, this may undermine efforts to contain the outbreak. So the draft order simply provides for the closure of core paths when land is being controlled to control disease. Uh, and I now look forward to, to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Um, do members have uh, questions to ask? Several people do, right? Um, Jim Hume, first of all. OK, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, convener. And good morning again, Paul. I think we've been seeing quite a lot of each other at various events in the last two or three days. But anyway, um, yeah, unfortunately, in my past, or fortunately, in some respects, I was quite had some experience of foot and mouth and what can happen and regarding that access. Uh, uh, I should say I uh, presided over Lothian and Borders NFU during the foot and mouth years and remember it well. Part of the problems back then were the, the responsibilities for animal health were, were delegated but not the budget. But that's been fixed and the budget is now delegated as well as the, the health uh, responsibilities. But According to Richard Lockhead, um, there is the, and the recent budget figures, there's no money has been put uh, aside for fighting any outbreaks, God forbid, of animal health uh, issues such as foot and mouth. I was just wondering uh, what your views were on that. Uh, well, well, first of all, convener, I mean it's it's not an issue that would be resolved by this order, um, I, and it is a matter um, for for the cabinet secretary really to address, but. Certainly, you know, we take take animal health issues extremely seriously, uh, and I'm sure, as, as Mr. Hume knows, the, the devastation that it caused, in, uh, not only in Scotland but in the north of England as well, the, the, the foot and mouth outbreak, uh, the, the importance of the issue. So uh, I think we have demonstrated in uh, the government's commitment in the past with foot and mouth uh, disease outbreak that we were prepared to step in and support uh, farmers when, unfortunately, the, uh, at the time, the UK government was not willing to do so. So we, we have, um, you know, you know, put our money where our mouth is in the past, but I, I certainly would uh, convene our, um, we can write back to the committee about the position in terms of funding for animal health, if that would be helpful to Mr Human and to colleagues, um, okay. just to clarify that. Um, Alec Ferguson. Uh, it's on the, the same subject of responsibility, but not financial. Um, Minister, good morning to you. Um, just to put it on the record, I think it might be clear in the notes, but just to put it on the record, if these powers were to be used... Can I ask whose responsibility it is to ensure that the access, potential access taker is notified of the temporary closures? Uh, well, my understanding, I'll, I'll check with um, colleagues uh, as well if they want to chip in, but my understanding is it's the local access authority that has responsibility to ensure that measures are implemented. Uh, there are obviously situations where we're, if somebody's looking for a closure for more than six days, that ministers would be consulted on, on, uh, on, on, on whether we think, think that's appropriate, and so that's a, an important uh, sort of safeguard to protect uh, public access uh, uh, provision. But certainly the local access authority, which is the local authorities or indeed the national parks, would have a responsibility for the implementation of this and to ensure it's properly uh, you know, monitored and, and policed. That, that, I thought that was the case, but it's good to have it on the record. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Uh, morning, Minister. You've partially answered my question in your response to Alec Ferguson, but I just, just want to get further clarification. When we talk about the Commonwealth Games, I would assume that actually pertains to my own constituency as well, with Barry Burden and the, the shooting range. Therefore, if a closure of the core path was to be for more than six days and it comes back to you as the Minister, how will you strike the appropriate balance between the need to close a path for the duration of an event and not encroaching too much on people's rights to have access to it, perhaps at the, at the either end of the, the period? Well, I think it's a, a very important point. The first thing is just to stress that um, we don't have, if you like, a definitive list of which core paths are affected by the Commonwealth Games and we rely on the local authority to come to us if they feel it's necessary. Um, to, to take advantage of the, the, uh, the order and the provisions in the order to um, ensure that a path is closed for a particular venue, whether it's Barry Budden or other sites that are affected by the Commonwealth Games. So uh, I'm not in a position where I have a definitive list that I can share with the committee. But um, clearly, uh, when anything comes before ministers, we do have to take very uh, seriously the 
um, the, the implications in terms of ensuring uh, responsible access to the countryside is as, as, and, and other sites is protected best it, it can be. But clearly there will be practical considerations if it was to happen in Barry Budden because of the, uh, the, the, the nature of the um, need to control admission numbers to ensure health and safety of people that are in the area at the time the event is going on. And it's a very practical example of, of, of why you need to consider public access issues, whether it's appropriate um, at that time. So I can give you assurance when it, if anything comes before me, I will um, take a very balanced view as to the, the balance between the need to ensure public have access to, to land through the Land Reform Act and uh, the uh, very strong um, sentiment there is across Scotland to, to ensure uh, the right to responsible access to, to, to uh, the land, but at the same time to protect the, the public interest, public safety, and, and to ensure the security of, of the events themselves. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, but we obviously will take all matters into account. Lydia well, Beamish. Vina. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, it's, it's also related to uh, the right to responsible access, and, and I've gained reassurance from the, the, your previous answer to Graham Day, but could I just clarify in relation to the long-term Section 11 orders, um, I, I see there's a clear path of consultation and, 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 and that side of it, but would there ever be uh, an occasion where any such order would be open-ended, and if so, would there be um, an appropriate review mechanism? I, I, th I think um, on, on whether it would be open-ended, I'll maybe defer to colleagues to sort of say whether there's been any uh, in consultation, whether there's been any sort of discussion around that subject. But certainly, uh, where we we're looking at a situation where uh, a closure would be required for you know, more than six days, uh, clearly a case would, would have to be made. There are, even in the, the context of a, an animal health outbreak, um, like, like a foot and mouth disease, uh, you know, the six, the six days is the is a kind of effectively the minimum period, uh, and obviously, um, you know, there, there would be a degree of having to monitor the the, the seriousness of the outbreak. So I, I maybe ask, I don't know, whether, um, Bill or Andy Barry would would want to comment on the specifics relation to animal health, where I could see there might be more of an open-ended uh, situation if there was a very serious outbreak. Um, but for a particular event, I think it would be possible to define the length of time uh, that that would be required. In fact, I would be looking very unfavourably on, on, on something that was a public event like a car show that had to be open-ended. I would ask questions why. So I think um, you know, sort of anything that came before ministers that was looking for more than six days, I would be uh, questioning why there was not uh, a defined period. But I think it's more likely to be in an animal health situation, so I don't know what, which of my colleagues would like to respond to that point. But. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one up. Thank you, Minister. In terms of animal health disease, clearly the, the length of now the length of closure will depend on the circumstances of the outbreak and also whether or not disease has spread or not. Um, clear, well, what, what happens is that uh, when, it, when a disease is found and the, uh, the, the department moves in, then there's a veterinary assessment of all the risks. Uh, action is taken to eradicate the disease and then there's a further veterinary assessment. And when that is clear, uh, then ministers are advised that the, the, the closures can be raised, it can be lifted, and our objective would be to, to lift the, any restrictions, including restrictions on access, as quickly as possible. Uh, particularly if there's a, a number of outbreaks, because we want to move on to the next one as, as soon as we can. Um, I would just like to ask you about an issue related to this. Um, it refers to core paths. But what about to rights of way? Um, I, I, it's a good point, convener. If I may ask um, my colleague Helen Jones just to, to make a distinction there, that would be helpful. Um, rights of way are not covered by this order, and that is because um, the legislation, the Land Reform Scotland Act, only allows us to amend section 6 and 7 of the Act. It doesn't allow us to deal with any of the legislation relating to rights of way. So if there was a right of way, that would have to be closed under um, ex other legislation, I'm afraid. So perhaps it would be useful for us to know what the other legislation is. If you don't have it in front of you, you can write to us. We will write to you on that. But it's, there is road traffic legislation, but we will certainly write to you. I mean, I think about events such as um, agricultural shows and so on, in which, you know, both the question about animal health, etc., crowds and so on, come into play. And I think it would be worth us knowing that, given that there are 
obviously places where rights of way exist in the areas where such events take place. But that's a very fair point, Camino. We can we can write uh, to you on what other legislation affects such events. Um, I think. Uh, what effectively we're trying to do through the provision of this order is where there's already defined circumstances where land could be closed in the event of an animal health outbreak or indeed uh, in relation to, to, to an event that uh, the core pass would also be covered. So, uh, you know, we're effectively just ensuring that core pass are covered by the animal health legislation, for example, in the same way as land is. But, but yes, I totally take the point. There may be other circumstances which we can we can look at through other legislation. The case in Barry Button, I don't know. It's not in my constituency, but, you know, rights of way are something which, you know, we uh, would it would be valuable to, to know about anyway. So thank you very much for that. No further questions? Uh, this, uh, that's the case. Um, I think we can now, um, if you wish to wind up at the moment, uh, that would be fine before we actually move to the formal process. Uh, thank you. We have nothing further to add other than thank the members for their consideration of the, the order. Yeah. So we're at agenda item three, and this is the formal part of the uh, subledge. Uh, the third item is consideration of the motion S4M 08517, uh, asking that the committee <coughs> recommends approval of the Affirmative Instrument Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 Modification Order 2013 Draft. Um, and obviously we've discussed this motion. Uh, if there are any uh, interplay between members and the Minister, then there's no uh, question of uh, the officials now taking part in that. Um, would the Minister like to speak and move the motion? Thank you, Convener. I, I move that the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee recommends that the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 Modification Order 2013 draft be approved. Thank you. Um, are there any members who wish to comment? There being none, does the Minister wish to wind up? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll decline. Commissioner. Well, I put the question on the motion. That is, the question is that motion S4M 08517 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we will record that result and confirm that the committee's report will uh, confirm the outcome of the debate which we've had in the affirmative. Uh, thank the Minister for his uh, attention and uh, his large number of officials who didn't get a chance to speak this time, but we'll see if we can find some means to bring them all in at another point. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we move on to draft uh, document in agenda item four uh, to rules uh, 10.5 of the standing orders. Our fourth item committees to consider the following draft statutory guidance the Land Reform Scotland 2003 Modification Order 2013, statutory guidance SG 2013 254. I refer members to the paper and ask whether the committees agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this guidance. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Now, the details of the next meeting are at uh, our final meeting of 2013, so far as we know. Uh, the committee will hold evidence sessions on the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003, Remedial Order 2014. And, and I now move... Uh, that the meeting go into private and ask the public gallery to be cleared. And uh, we will now close the meeting to the public and move into private.